Good morning. Today let's, let us discuss about the 11th December 2015 newspaper. In this, the first article is related to the Haryana Panchayat law. The Supreme Court bench headed by Justice Chalameshwar, Justice Justice Chalameshwar, has upheld the Haryana Panchayat law. What are the important provisions of this? The educational qualifications are mentioned for the people to contest the Panchayat elections. The matriculation for the open category and 8th class for the men from scheduled caste, 5th class for the women from uh, scheduled caste. So because of this, almost 60% um, of the women from the scheduled caste, 68% to be precise, and 41% from uh, scheduled caste men, they are disqualified to contest the elections. Then it was challenged in the Supreme Court. The counter argument is this. No person chooses to be illiterate. His circumstances drive him towards illiteracy. Now in this context, what is the Supreme Court's argument? The government and Supreme Court, they agreed that the minimal educational qualification is necessary to understand the governance and to deliver the efficiency of performance at the panchayat level. And coming to the sanitation, the condition in the law is that every person shall have a toilet at home. Now after the Swachh Bharat total sanitation campaign, the state governments were very active in providing for the toilets to avoid the opentification. Now even in this scenario, a person is not having a toilet at home. It means it is more by a choice or rather than by a situation. So it's a willful default to have a toilet. So most of the panchayat functions are related to the sanitation. The leader heading the panchayat has to set an example by having a toilet at his home itself. That is what is the Supreme Court argument is. Financial discipline. As per the law, anyone who defaults on the payment of the electricity bills and also the defaults on payments to the cooperative societies, he is disqualified to contest the elections. Here, the agricultural indebtedness is increasing. So in this context, uh, this provision uh, was seen as um, against to the growing agrarian crisis on the rural side. The Supreme Court argued that um, Haryana is relatively a well-off state. Um, and in India, any election and every election is a huge financial expense on the part of the candidates. Generally, an indebted candidate has a little chances to contest the elections. So, these people can be concluded as willful defaulters who are using their power to get away from the payment of these bills. So, from this context, the Supreme Court held the Aryana Panchayat law. The next is the Digital India Project. So, why India has to focus on Digital India? Now, if you take uh, the Prime Minister's visit to various countries, especially in the West, he has focused on uh, developing the technological partnerships with the Silicon Valley. So, in this context, um, the goal of India-United States trade is around $500 billion, and which stands at $1 or $2 billion today. So, if we have to reach to this target, um, the technology and innovation is only the way out. Um. And India has the abundant human resources to achieve this particular goal. So for that, the flagship program of India, that is Digital India, shall show the way or path. What are the reasons for this? The Digital India program is a source to bring in something called as inclusion and innovation. Either Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana or improving the last mile connectivity are providing for financial inclusion and uh, programs to spur the local manufacturing through make uh, make in india everything is one or the other way connected to the digital india so the smart cities mission a uh, reforming of the discoms where uh, smart grid project is vital and uh, Providing for financial inclusion, everything whatever I am talking about uh, is connected with the digital India. So in this context, um, the private sector innovation was critical to the success of digital India. 
to achieve this private sector innovation the government has to take few steps forward so it and broadband infrastructure has to be improved on a war footing if you take the network readiness index or un e government index india's performance was dismal with regard to the network i mean creation of a, a last mile connectivity especially the rural india is still unconnected from the world so that's why it is unable to spur the consumer demand in the rural india so the rural india is not coming into the economic growth process are not adding value or to the market so if you want to mainstream the rural india into the global market the connectivity plays a major role so the network creation of the network and last mile connectivity has to be the first priority so national fiber optic broadband network or optical fiber network is already doing this it is the time we speed up this particular process and the second thing is the small and medium enterprises they are the backbone for the employment generation in the country so the e-commerce business it has to focus on making this a small and medium enterprises to reach to the national and global consumers there are many on ground innovations over here if you talk about fab india so it is trying to bring in the rural weavers to the national market similarly if you talk about china the alibaba group it is trying to bring in every manufacturer either small or big to the global consumer such a e-commerce innovation that brings in the ground level product innovation to the global consumer is necessary for for india the third thing is the electronics industry is very critical for the success of the digital india so in this context india's electronic policy or india's standards anything which is approved by the best labs in the world also need to be reapproved by the bureau of indian standards even i apple phone to be sold in india the bis has to give the certificate because of this regulation there is a huge bottleneck and delay so india can develop a relationship with the standardized labs across the world a electronic product which is certified in the standardized lab shall be automatically allowed into india so if these three are taken up so the last mile connectivity availability of the hardware and also the e-commerce platforms can provide for a connection between the producer and consumer a national market that is widely connected to the global market can bring in wealth and prosperity to this particular country so that is what is the argument so this is a very good argument you can upload your e governance topic of my class through this particular digital india so and next is the mall nutrition rates i am going to read this report very soon and i will update the more and more information because the health is an important topic in india uh, in our syllabus paper 2 so there is global nutritional report um, and indian health report two reports were released so they have made an important observations with regard to the stunting and malnutrition and delivery gaps uh, women and nutritional status in the country so though india has achieved significant progress with regard to the nutritional improvement still most of the stunted people up to the 39% so they live in india so there is sarcastically a situation has been said as this if the malnourished people are regarded as a separate country in india or the malnourished people in india are if regarded as a separate nation then this would be the ninth or tenth largest nation in the world ninth largest nation so that is sarcastical comparison but however it shows the the intensity of the problem and um, you can see the differences in the malnutrition vaccination and food related uh, new challenges are wide across the states in india on one spectrum the tamil nadu kerala they have progressed well on the other spectrum up bihar they have the highest stunting even today 
that shows the delivery gaps that are existing in uh, the nutritional uh, delivery programs. So improving uh, on these delivery gaps, reducing the leakages that can address the problem much better. And also reports say that um, there is a clear connection between the indicators on women empowerment uh, and improving the nutritional levels in the family. You know that the first priority of the mother is to uh, give nutrition to the children. So if woman has greater control over the family wealth, uh, then automatically it will show a reflection on the nutritional levels of the family. So on the other hand, uh, India has improved its status um, with regard to the breastfeeding and also the under 5 overweight reduction. So this is a positive development. And uh, if you take on the other side, uh, India has a conglomeration or a group of problems coming together. One is malnutrition, obesity and the communicable and non-communicable diseases. Uh, both the sides of the spectrum, they are existing in India. On one side underweight is there, on the other side highest overweight uh, and uh, related lifestyle diseases such as diabetes, hypertension. And at the same time, on one side we have the communicable diseases, on the other side non-communicable diseases. Now coming to the Pakistani talks. So view from Raval Pindi by Suhasini Haider, it's a beautiful article. Now if you see in India-Pakistan relationships, the Pakistan military always played a dominant role. So it is not visible across the table but it is influencing the civilian administration in Pakistan in every possible way. Now, if you take about General Sharif's position in Pakistan now, there is some clarity with regard to the role of the civilian administration uh, headed by the Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and the role the military has to play. So, in this context, um, the General Sharif's image has increased due to his action on the militancy in the North Waziristan, especially after the attack on military school in Rawalpindi, then, sorry, Peshawar, not Rawalpindi, military school in Peshawar, he was, at, he, he was in, I mean, very strong in action against these uh, uh, militancy in the Pakistan. So the program is called as National Action Plan Policy, which has clearly provided for the results uh, and it decreased the number of militant attacks on Pakistan. And the second thing is, Russia and Pakistan are coming close to each other. And the defense deals are signed between these two countries. And two billion dollars gas is being supplied to Pakistan now. That a resurgence of Pakistan-Russia relations, which was never encouraged by Russia in the past, is given a credit to the General Sharif. So now, in these circumstances, uh, if you observe, the National Security Advisor was recently replaced in Pakistan. So after the UFA summit, if you see, there is no mention of Kashmir in the UFA summit. The military took it really a negative development. And Mr. Satras Aziz, who was the National Security Advisor, he was replaced by Nasir Khan, who was close to the General Sharif. It shows that um, in India-Pakistan dialogue, the military still is playing a prominent role. And on the other hand, if you talk about the India-Pakistan talks, um, either it is composite dialogue, after that the resumed dialogue, after that today's comprehensive dialogue. Whenever the dialogue process has started, the non-state actors, especially the Lashkare, Taiba, Jaishi, Mahmud, etc., they try to derail the process through one or the other militant event. So India and Pakistan has to raise in uh, this particular uh, factions and has to continue their dialogue process, which has to be considered as only the solution way out for this many. And the next is. This is about Islamic State. The first thing is, the Islamic State, it has its limits of expansion. We all know that the Islamic Caliphate of Baghdadi, it is surrounding, it is existing at Raqqa in Syria. So, 
from Raqqa, it was able to expand to another city that is called Pamaira. After that, its expansion has stopped in Syria. The ultimate objective of the Islamic State is to take the control of the Damascus. But however, the recent Russian support to the Assad and the strong motivated state forces, these are still able to take or protect the Damascus. So, the southward expansion from Raqqa to Damascus, that is uh, southward and westward expansion in Syria is almost stopped. If you go to Iraq, you have Mosul as the uh, place or headquarters for the Islamic State. Now, it wanted to go to Baghdad from Mosul. So, in the process, it has occupied the Ramadi, Kirkuk, Tikrit, Falouza, but it has lost them very soon. At the same time, when it was marching towards Erbil, Erbil is the capital of the Iraqi Kurdistan. The Quds are a very strong force against the Saddam Hussein. So Erbil, which is the capital of Iraqi Kurdistan, when Islamic State started moving towards that, America has intervened and bombed over there because America has its own interests and Quds, uh, the America had close relations with them over there. And the second thing is, um, these Kurds, uh, these are also the strong fighters against the Islamic State. In this context, um, the Erbil is a pro now, the, it was nowhere close to the Erbil. Though it is close to the Mosul, it was unable to have its control. And uh, coming to the Turkey-Syrian border, at this place, um, the people protection units, especially Quds, uh, they are very active and they have uh, stopped the growth of the Islamic State, forward movement of the Islamic State. So here, Tal Abayad, Kobain, these are the two small cities at the Turkey-Syrian borders which are occupied by these uh, Kurdish forces. It means westward, eastward, northeastward expansion, everything was stopped for the uh, this uh, Islamic State. Now in this context, you can see that the strategy of Islamic State always it was publicity plus violence have went together. So ma executions, especially the violence of beheading the people etc. This has led to the huge publicity and attraction of the radicalized youth towards the Islamic State. Even these incidents have decreased these days. So that's why Islamic State is not now focusing on killing the native people in these particular areas who practice the other sects and other beliefs. And um, uh, why? What has to be the strategy now? If you've seen either the uh, Assad forces in Syria fighting the Islamic State, their only objective is not to allow the Islamic State towards the Damascus. Similarly, the Quds fighting the Islamic State, they don't want their expansion of the Islamic State into their own territories. So, everyone who is fighting the Islamic State, they have their own interests. So, the core that is called Caliphate, that is Raqqa, it is undisturbed. So, core and periphery theory, this is what he's been following. The Islamic State wants to protect the core and carry out the attacks in the periphery in the rest of the world. So this core has to be disturbed. But none of these forces fighting the Islamic State have the intention to disturb the core. And the second issue over here is the geopolitics are playing a major role with regard to the fight against the Islamic State. If you take about Turkey, so the Turkey has bombed the Kurdish population which it considers as extremists. So these Kurds are fighting the Islamic State. The Turkey has bombed them and also got down the plane, Russian plane, which is bombing the Islamic State areas. And the second, the Saudi Arabia, it considers that the Islamic State has weakened the Shia Iran. You know Saudi Arabia is Sunni dominated. So the Saudi Arabia versus Iran geopolitics, it made the Saudi to be silent on the Islamic State. So 
a pan arab coalition against the islamic state uh, is not arrived because of the sectarian conflict and also geopolitics involved so in this context um, a coordinated strategy is necessary to fight the islamic state this is this article is all about and now let us go to the this is uh, the china's role in of pakistan dialogue this is a very much important thing with regard to our current affairs are concerned today so china has a muslim or this islamic violence growing in xinjiang province it fears that um, the afghanistan violence can spill over into xinjiang and with regard to its economic corridor afghanistan the gwadar kashgar economic corridor is very critical to connect itself to the eurasia so in this context um, this also helps for china to bypass the malacca strait and in the malacca strait you all know that the america has a greater control and military presence so for this um, the china is actual uh, actively involved uh, to provide for or to have an engagement between afghanistan and pakistan and also this economic corridor is providing an access uh, to china to the indian ocean which it never had so this geopolitical interest is making china to involve with this so you can see china has actively recommending the afghanistan and pakistan to the shanghai cooperation organization and also massive financial aid was given to the afghanistan and the climate change talks i don't find anything new so the european union it is stressing for 5 years of verifiability so that is measurement reporting and verifiability of indcs intended nationally determined contributions uh, shall be done once in 5 years uh. so these are the things we need to understand so this is about today's newspaper so there are many good articles in today's newspaper try to go through them and thank you very much